What's uh, let me first ask if there's any questions or reactions or thoughts from Pat specifically. Um, given we just finished, and then we can open up in a minute. Are there any specific reactions, thoughts? I have a, I have a uh, comment. Uh, I, I think um, the relation um, that you reported between adversity, uh, mm -hmm. the inverse relation, early adversity and yeah. purpose. I'm pretty skeptical of that. Uh, I think um, it's almost certainly going to be a curvilinear relationship. Uh, I'm so a, glad you asked this because we tested that and it doesn't show up. So, <laughs> so, so okay, so I'm not going to accept that exactly. Uh, uh, how did you test? Well, that, I don't want to. I don't want to provoke a long answer, but uh, let me just say the basis of my skepticism that everything we know of from lots of data sets related to adversity type of things like stress mm -hmm. and challenges and so on uh, shows that there actually is an optimal level of right. stress and challenge that, mm -hmm. that provokes healthy development, not just purpose, but of all kinds. And when you go beyond that, it, it, it overwhelms mm -hmm. the system. Uh, when you don't have enough of that, uh, you may not even get the, the sufficient motivation yeah, and, 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 and yeah. that goes way back. That goes back to Sigmund Freud, even, uh, let mm -hmm. alone, you know. And, and, and I totally, I, I, I didn't mean to be curt or anything. Um, I, I totally agree with the idea, and that's one of the reasons we had tested it, that we kind of expected that curvilinear relationship in the data set. Um, one thing to point out is a lot of these are rather, like it's not just right. were you facing an obstacle right. as you much put, as you, you put a lot of stuff into that diverse into that adversity category and that's that's what I was getting at that mm -hmm. you, you separate out uh, stressors that are more likely to provoke responses that would be to overcome it as opposed to things like having a alcohol parent or you know, all kinds of stuff like that so yeah you, you got to make those distinctions and we do test it with respect to the individual categories of purpose. So we threw them all in as individual predictors of purpose. And we tested the curvilinear trends for each of those individual categories. And we never found a curvilinear trend that we were really expecting, even for something like SES disadvantage, might show that kind of obstacle that you have to overcome element. Um, it could be that this measure is pro like focusing on rather maladaptive, like maladaptive things. It could just be that when it comes to this particular construct, it's not showing up. Well, it's like any null, null finding. Uh, you know, the, the null finding doesn't really, doesn't give you a final uh, right. explanatory answer. You have to keep looking for other things. I, 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 I was just, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm expressing my skepticism based on everything I know about development, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not questioning uh, this, the data mm -hmm. that you, that you yeah. um, We do have similar data with respect to, uh, Nick's been doing <coughs> the work on early adversity and personality traits later in life, and we don't um, find much evidence there. Uh, so maybe it's just with the specific early adversity measure that the curve linear relationships aren't showing up. Well, yeah, I mean, if you think about it, if you, if you really created a broad umbrella of adversities, are, are you really wanting to claim that, uh, that <laughs> that uh, a life uh, where all adversity is eliminated is, uh, is the ideal uh, condition for development of purpose. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense in terms of mm -hmm. any of the people. I mean, look at any of, the, any of the people that historically have been exemplars of purpose. You know? I mean, Nelson Mandela, you know, uh, he had a lot of adversity in his life. And mm -hmm. so did he end up with no purpose? I don't think so. So I mean, just if you just think through it in a common sense way, it just doesn't make any sense. Okay. Did you look at any moderators just quickly of that relationship? Of that relationship? Yeah. Uh, we tried, I think the one thing we looked at was whether they were make, able to make a sense of their past. Yeah. So there is an item in the, uh, the Midas of whether you could, so if you think about kind of this idea, you might be able to take the adversity like as, okay, I, I understand what that means for me now. And that still didn't seem to have much, when you control for it or try to test it as a moderating effect, it didn't pan out. Uh, we, they actually wanted it out of the paper, so it's not in the final manuscript, but like, that seemed like the most obvious thing of if you have adversity and you can make sense of your past, 
that might be the protective element. And similar to uh, what Bill is saying, like we have worked on the pathways that one might take to a sense of purpose, one of which being this kind of reflective component, that if you reflect upon what happened to you, reflect upon negative things that happened to your friends and family in the past that might generate, catalyze you to your life goals. So part of it was we really kind of came into it thinking there might be those two groups of individuals who are able to make sense of it, reflect upon it, and that actually might promote a sense of purpose in life. Uh, but the data just didn't really pan out on that front. So. I think there is other data though related to resilience in mm -hmm. after, and post-traumatic growth after earthquakes, tsunamis, <coughs> and things like that, mm -hmm. um, that have shown exactly what you're saying though. Yeah. Yeah. In the Midas data set, excuse me for interrupting, but if you were was pertinent to this exchange, so a uh, paper by Greg Miller and Edith Chan looked at uh, people who grew up in SES adversity in early life, and having the moderator, the key moderator, was having a nurturing mother. And, and they were at reduced risk for showing metabolic syndrome in adult life relative to those who grew up with early SES adversity that didn't have that protective benefit. So there are other variables in the data set you can look at. Can you go back to your slide that shows the uh, different uh, trajectories of change? Yeah. No, no, no. Go back a couple more. Oh, this one? Yeah. yeah. So it, it, that's, of course, two times of testing. Is that correct? Yeah. And uh, so I, I love this because it shows that uh, averages are not what we should be focusing in on because the average is not representative mm -hmm. of the distribution. Yeah. yeah, and that was the suggestion I was going to make for yeah. your data that you went on from that later. But uh, so then, what you're saying is, when you went to three times testing, that disappeared. So to, uh, the patterns of change do show up. There is into individual variability for those who have been retired the whole time. Um, it is also the largest group, so there aren't as many people in these other groups. Um, but some of these other groups uh, did not, particularly the working group, did not show much inter-individual variability there. So that's well, why. Yeah. Well, you have four different groups there. That shows that if you average your cost, yeah. no, you yeah, that's meaningless average. Right. Yeah, and, and that's where we were. Like when we got to this bullet point, which was like last week before my student helped me out for this bullet point, um, that's kind of where we were last week of why isn't there anything going on and it really is, like if you take the overall average of these groups, it's not reflecting what's going on uh, either with respect to different groups or with respect to the overall, like the overall sample is not being represented well by that mean. So I, I just wanted to also come in, I think that you, you were correct, there are abundant data that shows, uh, whether it's resilience mm -hmm. literature or other literature, that shows that adversity can be mm -hmm to growth, and, and that is, in fact, it was a conference that JTF had that Aranda and um, um, Inferno, uh, Frank Inferno are now mm -hmm. uh, uh, pushing a wall on in terms of uh, uh, an RFP to look at uh, growth that could occur after a uh, challenge or, or, yeah. or even trauma. So there is a growing literature about mm -hmm. that. So you don't, I, I'm not surprised that I agree with Bill, uh, that you don't want to say that uh, adversity cannot have potential growth promoting. Yeah, and I, you know, I'd even I'd even make a stronger statement about it than I think was suggested by Carol that it's not just a matter that there are factors that protect you against it so you can somehow get back to normal or something like that. That there are actually experiences of adversity, you know, I agree you combine the reflection of the kind you mentioned. They actually promote more growth. Mm -hmm. uh, they go beyond the normal. So uh, that's I, why you should look at personal growth, not just purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this brings up one uh, of the most stereotypical things we see in people confronting uh, sort of diagnosis of life-threatening disease. This is one of the most reliable interventions to promote growth and purpose and meaning of life is to you know, tell you, well, actually, that life is going to be pretty short, which you almost you know, mm -hmm. observe almost as a rule, even when people are actually injected. Oh, mm -hmm. you just tell them they have cancer, they nevertheless think they're going to die almost immediately. The vast majority of them inject most of the, 
things that crowd their days and focus in uh, on a small number of really important relationships or yeah. personal missions in life, uh, in much the same way that Laura Carstensen talks about people changing mm -hmm. and sort of focusing their purpose and engagement as they do. They Her brain wrote a wonderful essay called My, My Father's Flower Box about just that. Some of us who knew her know that essay. But it's not just actual shortness of life, it's also mortality salient. So there's some data showing that when students are asked to think more about their death or to write what they want on their headstone, they become more purposeful. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting intervention, especially considering our society's aversion to thinking about death. Except you think about it every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's why she's so developed. <laughs> well, I, the, uh, the, the slide with the moderators, we found that education. Yep. Can you go back to that? So uh, there's a paper uh, from longitudinal research conducted in Seattle by K. Warner Child mm -hmm. uh, that you're, whether you're, you know that, you basically replicate the finding from 1968, which is great right news. Mm -hmm. So it's Shai Stroger's site bulletin 1968. Yep. Um, and it was interesting that we found, like, it was nice that we found it here because we were kind of confused after not finding anything in the moment of aging that was a moderator. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, we have the, uh, the measure of purpose that Carol and colleagues created and and then we have a number, several, that really define out of that the folks that are highly committed to something beyond that has an impact beyond the self. And those to me seem quite distinctly different kinds of uh, constructs and related, but not the same thing. And I'm seeing a lot of differences in the results that you're suggesting and even some on, on Carol's and ours, uh, in terms of the uh, the loss of purpose with age, the the it, some of the rela relationship with I think relationship with adversity, certainly the relationship with uh, economic uh, challenge and and health challenge and so on, and I just would be interested in hearing other people talk about ours. Our measure that we use is so different because it's not a continuous measure, first of all. Mm -hmm. So that makes a huge difference. Um, and it's also, a, I think, quite a high bar for what counts as purpose. So even in, it, it, basically, half the people never are purposeful, as far as we can mm -hmm. tell, uh, more than half. Uh, and so if you treat uh, the purpose scale is a continuous thing, and it doesn't have a really strong requirement that it be impact beyond the self. And it's something that basically everybody can have some of and probably does. In other words, it, it seems to me it can change really a lot of the associations and the predictions and understanding what it means and so on. And it, it's not to say that either one is, you know, I think they're, they're each has really uh, important mm -hmm. a contribution to make, but let's not, just because we call them both purpose, and mm -hmm. that's why I kept trying to say purpose beyond self, conflate them to yeah. be the same thing so that if the results with one kind of construct and measure don't match the ones with the other, then it's like, oh my god, how can we figure this out? You know, there must be something wrong with the method or something. It's, it could well be that these are just two different constructs, mm -hmm. and we should pay more attention to the differences between them. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to add to that just for a second because I was intrigued by the fact that both Bill and Anne, you define purpose as being ego transcending purpose. Uh -huh. And I'm not sure that one has to do that. It seems like they are two separate dimensions. You have a purpose and then it can be ego transcending or eudaimonic or it could be hedonic. And Aristotle actually said we all have eudaimonic and hedonic purposes and, and direction. If we we're only hedonic, he said, we are like raising animals. So he, he didn't like that, but he said, we all have that. 
Oh yeah. And so I guess I'm wondering. But the non you know, itself can be very unimonic. It doesn't have to be. Right. If it can be. So is that a non-purpose though? If it's, it's, it's self-focused. If I want to golf better. Well, it's a goal. It's a, it's a long-term goal that is that you care about. That you care about, and it's similar to what Angela to Angela Blackwood writes about as the kind of higher order goals that uh, define grit. Uh, but we have made. Uh, I tried to explain this morning why we made the choice to define purpose in the way we did, to give it a special, to try to understand what the special contribution of something called purpose is. Mm -hmm. And I would, and again, I agree with Anne that I think there's tremendous value in all of these research programs. But I would ask the, I guess I would ask the, maybe, or challenge the question of, um, in what ways is the way you're operationalizing purpose distinct from other dimensions of well-being, of, of goals, of all the other related constructs in this, in this constellation of uh, adaptive uh, psychological processes. And I, as I said, I'm, I'm not at all saying that that doesn't exist, but I think that, that would be the question I'd ask. And, mm -hmm. and, and the reason that we did this was because this seemed to be the best shot at capturing what people meant by purpose in philosophy, theology, and everything else, and that made it a, t a unique construct that that is particular, that's special, that you can then say, what does purpose itself add to all the other strengths and capacities and adaptive functions in the world? Um, so just, just to build up that, that's not what I want to talk about, was um, we have a uh, study that just came out last month with uh, 7,000 people showing you have this when you do a phenomenological assessment of these processes, right? If you got the personalized, subjectively, happiness and self-compassion, um, everything loads on what we call a W factor, just like general G. So you have this high order factor, everything loads together, um, and it's super tight. And the correlation between the hedonic and eudaimonic phenomenological measures the latent correlation is 0.96. Oh, I know, yeah. So that's what we found. And then we replicated this now two times and we're now submitting the papers. Um, but that doesn't say that we shouldn't explore at the lower levels. What it means is at the phenomenological level, when you ask someone, how's life going for you, people just kind of say, good to shit. Or that's kind of basically, and which is, which is nice about this kind of new yeah. measures that we're developing of kind of creating some level of ideographic, contextualized kind of approaches to kind of break free from this phenomenological piece. Um, but I, what I want to go back to is the adversity of stuff. I think mm -hmm. that's great. Um, and I'm happy to send to those papers, even yeah, the ones that aren't great. published yet. It's fine because we're small group. Um, the adversity one. So um, I come from more of an appreciable, appreciative inquiry approach. Um, with very strong opinions about the adversity. Um, to me, there's a couple things. One is I think the key thing for past talk is early life is the key aspect of it. So are there critical periods where the chronicity or the severity or the environmental conditions that people grow up in such that it overrides the potential to be a springboard to higher peak to developing meaning, purpose, or something like that. The second one is, is temporality, in terms of like at what period for a particular person does an event have serve as like um, a healthy purpose or serve as actually a maladaptive piece of their lives. And the third one is, you know, we really get divorced from the measurement, which is when we ask about life events, we're no different than the research of the 70s, where we basically do a life event checklist. And the best, the state of the art practice of, of measuring life events and adversity is George Brown's approach in, in the UK, which is really time intensive, and I learned this, it took me years, which is you get, you have one person collect information about the events over a time period, and then you've enough, you have one, so you get a self-report rating, you have an interviewer that collects the information and then reports it to a group to code those events and particularly tells the story of those events, divorcing it from whatever emotional difficulties and health difficulties they're experiencing at the time, such that objective, and I'll give you the perfect example. So you can create some form of putting scare quotes, objective rating of stress. So for example, in George Brown's approach, it's considered that if your mother dies, that's like one of what he calls 1A out of 5 points, like one of the worst stressors that you're going to have. But someone like myself, who's raised by my grandmother, um, my grandmother would be a 1A, right? Because but normally if your grandparent dies, it would be less important than. But the contextual piece makes it she moves up to 1A. Now when you ask, just ask, did your parents
kind of stuff, which is how most of our methodologies approach, you don't distinguish between those two. And really, when you get down to people and not variables, you realize that a lot of our approaches really fail. So these large samples, um, you lose that variability. So I'm not, I'm not um, so so much as skeptical about Patrick's findings, but more of that what methodological piece of temporality aspects that can we do better for the next set of studies. This is kind of Rich's point about averaging stuff. Carl uh, Rose's point. Yeah. yeah, I don't read as much as you guys. I just make stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of average. So my question is about is about these kind of interviews and as interventions in and of themselves. So I work with college students and we I try to do these sort of purpose interventions. And what I hear back from them is that this is the first time anyone has asked them these questions. And it is simply a transformative moment to be able to talk about these issues and to ask these questions. So I'm interested in Anne and in this in this study that you guys did, is it um, do you ever you don't follow up. It, it's, I, I, I asked you, it's just sort of a, a one, it was a one-time interview. But in, other, in, in others of these sort of deep assessments of uh, people's life experiences and purpose, do you then follow up and do you have a control group, but do you see whether that interview itself boosts self-efficacy, boosts a sense of purpose, or changes? Medical medicine, yes. <laughs> I, I wrote some of my dissertation on that. Oh, good. <laughs> Fancy that. Uh, yeah, no, I wrote it up. So, so the answer is yes. yes. <laughs> and then does that skew the, I mean, and, but then does that skew your, all of this other research? So if the answer is yes. In theory, yes. you should control for it. In theory, you should control for it. Okay. People you interview if they're a subset of the larger group. Oh, absolutely. But, but we yeah, don't. We but we don't. We do. We do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We do, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's why we await that. The longitudinal weights and bunch of data. So Although, I think the interviews that we did, everybody felt incredibly affirmed. Mm -hmm. And so they wouldn't necessarily be pushed in a different direction. I wanted to go back to the, to the um, translation aspect of all that we've been discussing for you. How, how we're going to translate these concepts for you. And, um, uh, presumably an idea was to um, somehow develop interventions to encourage you to develop this, this more transcendent sense of purpose. And um, I was intrigued by um, uh, Anne's, Anne's finding and description that priorities and purpose in the encore years are not zero sum. Those with beyond the self goals also value the benefit from the new year is to pursue the self life goals. And I wondered whether or not we might take too narrow a focus with youth if this is a developmental issue. Going back to your question, Christine, about, you know, is this, are, 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 are we saying you can't do this in schools based on the finding? So I, so I guess whether or not um, you've investigated non-zero sum among youth as well as among older adults. You mean non-zero sum? In terms of setting those priorities over time, you know. Um, not explicitly. I mean, I have a couple. I mean, just a couple of. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of built into the concept that they're not mutually exclusive. That's one thing. And then um, saying, well, we have seen um, sort of tangentially related to what you're saying. I think is that. Kids, uh, we saw this with our civic purpose study, especially which was with um, high school seniors and then following them beyond that, um, that the, the most purposeful kids, the purpose kids in the in those studies were actually, um, they had like a participant identity, they were just participants that were involved, they talked about being involved in cell phone activities and linguistic activities and all different, and as part of that picture, they um, became perhaps because of that. I think the non zero comment, it, it's almost, a, it's not so much a finding or a, a research question, but it's an, it's an assumption of our work that these are not trade offs and that actually, it, it, this, is, this is also Mike Chicks and Mahai's theory of personality, by the way, that the folks that are that on any of these so called polarities, reflexive, impulsive, whatever, people that are high on both tend to be most, the most 
adaptive people. So um, we don't see these as a trade-off, or, or that there's anything wrong with following self-oriented goals or anything like that. And I think the findings that Patrick reported uh, indicate that too. So yeah, I mean, so that that would be a mistake. I think. No, but it's still an empirical question whether people experience it that way. And I think the people that are not purposeful beyond the self do think that it's a oh, zero-sum right. game. Right. And the right. reason they don't want to volunteer right. or do all that is they say, it'll get in the way of things that I want to do, travel, mm -hmm. take a class, mm -hmm. you know, stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but I would think it has real implications for intervention design. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just yeah. really, I really where the, trans where the yeah. translation is yeah. triggered. Yeah. I wanted to make an observation that I think it's slightly hazardous to organize a conference just around purpose. In life, and and I want to elaborate why. I, I mean, all conferences are wonderful, and we all come to you know, um, deepen our thinking. But uh, what I wanted to put out there is is more from Aristotle than eudaimonia, um, which is not just about purpose in life by any means. In fact, I would say. One title for a, a former paper we wrote that I really love, uh, it's called Know Thyself and Become What You Are. Mm -hmm. So eudaimonia is about becoming what you are. It's about knowing your daily. And that requires self-knowledge. That requires actually looking inward. And so I'm a little bit uncomfortable with pushing away from the self, um, framing uh, I appreciate problems of self-absorption and narcissism and sort of uh, preoccupation with the self in the formulation of goals, but I would argue even in early life when young people are sort of trying to find their way, they are trying to figure out, Bill, you refer to what is their spark? What, what is their <coughs> spark? And I think that requires asking questions about more than goals. For example, questions like, what are you good at? And when do young people begin to have a sense that they're good at one thing more than another? What are you not good at? Um, I think those are critically important questions. I think the self-knowledge part, and I use the phrase self-realization a lot, but I, hopefully I'm using it in a way that is you know, more than about self-absorption and narcissism. For me, it's really the sort of personal growth dimension, which is closest to Aristotle's meaning of eudaimonia, where you have to actually, I think through across the life course, you have to be looking inward, even if you're gonna be effective in pursuing goals that are beyond who you are, because you need to know how you can be effective in doing that. So. And so the, re the reason I think I started out with the big umbrella of being well-being is because I think there are multiple ways to be well. Purpose in life is one component of it, but some people are perhaps going to be, and I think we all know some of these people, they're going to be much better at being well because they're really good in the relational stuff. And they may not have bigger, higher order goals um, that maybe even go beyond their immediate proximal sphere. But, so this is just a pitch to say, I don't think we can put everything on the back of purpose in life. I, I think there are actually many other dimensions of positive functioning that you know need to be part of the discussion. I actually appreciate that kind of a lot. And I think that a lot of the issues that you bring up in terms of this self-absorption, meaning of the self, yeah. meaning beyond the self is so embedded in culture. Yeah. So I'd really like to hear all y'all's thoughts on um, how we think culture plays a role. It seems like in many of the presentations already this morning, you've alluded to that fact that it's, it, it's important. Um, I study immigrant youth and ethnic minority youth, and a lot of what our work has found is that purpose is really intricately tied to identity development and um, family obligations, especially the first um, presentation. You know, that idea of thinking outside the self and um, engaging in activities to assist the family and maintain family functioning. So I guess I have two general questions related to that. One is, you know, are, has your work with you guys explored these cultural family differences um, with respect to Youth purpose and 
the goals that they have. And then also, um, a developmentalist is also this idea of how we form um, these goals and how we learn about the importance of purpose and how that's socialized and whether there are family and cultural differences there. there there's a, a lot of work uh, going on uh, cross-culturally on purpose. It's, it's not done in my lab exactly, although it's done by people who used to be like Sean Moran and, uh, and uh, Lucy's Arroyo. And, there are studies in Brazil and China and Iceland that Ken Lee probably remember more places, mm -hmm. but there, there's at least a half a dozen places. And yeah, there are differences for sure. And there are lots of them. Uh, there's also lots of comparabilities. Uh, and all of that's available, so you could um, you could go on our website. I, 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 won't, I won't go into a long spiel about that here. But uh, but yes, uh, that's, an, that's a really important thing to look at. It's, in fact, that's a, that's a big Templeton uh, fund study, actually. Um, and I'll just say, um, just while well, I have four for a second, I'll just say I, I, I agree with what Carol said about how you have to keep purpose in context. It's not the only thing. Uh, it's just part of the picture. Uh, and um, we, we, we talked actually about another part of the picture that's, that's not actually part of the purpose, but absolutely critical uh, last night and this morning, uh, moral development. Uh, and that's just one other. Uh, there's lots of, lots of uh, things that develop that are important. I think it is, I, I personally think it is useful to, to break things out and, and have a conference on it. I, well, it, it would be, I'd be interested, Carol, you know, if you had a conference on, on the self, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm just, uh, what do you, uh, I think that's your you know, huge question at this right before lunch. But I mean, so what do you mean by the self? <laughs> well, I use no, the I'm phrase right. self-realization. I I really am interested in becoming what you are. So the self, as a kind of abstract category, interests me a lot less uh -huh. than Aristotle's key ideas about each of us comes into life with a unique spirit, unique capacities. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And a big task in life is figuring out what those capacities are. I agree. Yeah. So th I would love a conference you know, focused on that. I, well, um, yeah, and I think there are many different manifestations of <coughs> how people can come to know their daemon and then you know, try to put their daemon to good use. And that's where I think you know a lot of the goals can actually be enacted. But what that, concerns me is leaving out self-knowledge. Is that different than identity? That makes sense. It's a, a really good. Identity. It's a really good question. Is it different than identity? I don't know. I'm not immersed in that literature. Uh -huh. um, what I would, what I think was so compelling about Aristotle's ideas was this responsibility that you have to actually figure out what your unique right. capacities right. are. Right. That's different than just who Would am you I? stress uh, become the best of who you are, bring out the yeah. good, because when you say yeah. become who you are and you don't yeah. include that, it, yeah. it has a very different Yeah, meaning. but I mean, if we really you know, look at the whole book, the whole Nicomachean ethics, most of it is about ethics. It's, yeah. it's about the enactment of all That's of those right. things in ways that nurture, you know, well-lived lives. So, you so may be, you he may didn't leave that you. out at all. Right, right. but you that's mean. why it's so different right. to say, bring a, uh, become the best of who you are versus just you may be talking about, you are because you may be it talking about character and virtue. <clears throat> <Yeah>. <clears throat> right, probably, right. probably. Right. Uh, but mm -hmm. the main point I wanted to make is, <laughs> I think I'm exercising a little pushback about it's, it's bad to have the self as part of the formulation of what we're trying to do. No, it's called beyond the self. No, 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 I use this as an opportunity to say this is a fascinating conversation to be sure. And according to my reading, no one was hungrier than Aristotle. So <laughs> we should probably break for lunch. Exactly. Of course, during lunch, we can continue the conversation at the tables and pick up right where we left off. But just because lunch is here, we're